think you've already heard um, quite a bit about transverse myelitis and about ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which are both largely monophasic diseases. They happen once, they cause a lot of destruction, and then they go away and they don't usually come back. What I'm gonna show you today is a disease called neuromyelitis optica, which is more of a recurrent disease. It strikes over and over and over again and can leave a lot more damage in its path. Um, let's see if this works, good. So um, here uh, is a chart that um, helps me to think about neuromyelitis optica, which is in that uh, top corner over here where the y-axis is recurrence rate, and what you can see is that NMO kind of sits up there at the top. It happens a lot. If especially untreated, it can relapse any, you know, four or five even more times per year, which is very devastating. Some MS patients have the same high relapse rate. You could see transverse myelitis, which you heard about earlier, largely monophasic, about 80% of the time just happens once. It doesn't really tend to recur. Um, there's uh, one, ex of course, the exception in transverse myelitis are the recurrent cases, recurrent transverse myelitis. And I think what we tend to do is lump those patients in with the NMO group and call them neuromyelitis optica spectrum patients because they often share a similar pathology, which is shown here from an NMO brain, uh, where the pathology um, has a lot of perivascular inflammation with IgG and IgM and complement deposition, and this sort of defines a humoral pathology, which I have here on the x-axis that separates neuromyelitis optica from MS, which is considered more of a cell-mediated disease, and this will become more important later in the treatment section, but this is kind of how to think about NMO as different from TM and NMS. Another way to think about NMO is where it where it frequently attacks. So MS attacks the brain, it attacks the optic nerves, it attacks the spinal cord. TM, by definition, is just spinal cord. And NMO is more of optic nerve, brain stem, and spinal cord. So uh, again, another way to think about NMO. Um, what I'm gonna do is just kinda go through five different subjects within NMO. Um, definition, epidemiology, pathogenesis, workup, and treatment. And we'll start with definition here. And my definition of NMO is really simple. You have to have transverse myelitis, you have to have optic neuritis, and you can't have MS. So that's a very simplified way to think about NMO, but it gets more complicated when you have to rule out MS. It's really hard to rule out MS. Uh, so the Mayo folks have come up with criteria to sort of help us do that. In NMO, you typically have longitudinally extensive lesions. These are long lesions in the spinal cord, extending at least three vertebral segments. But in NMO, you don't have to have those really long segments. But if you do, you should think about NMO. Um, they're, they're typically much more inflammatory and much more recurrent. You can have lots of lesions, again, per year. And optic neuritis, it tends to be bilateral, doesn't have to be, and it tends to be recurrent. It happens, again, multiple times. I have patients come back to back to back three, every three, four months. They have another lesion in their optic nerve. And then to rule out MS, what we try to do is we use a combination of the brain MRI, uh, an NMO IgG blood test, which is very specific for NMO. That is, if you're positive for that test, you really should consider NMO as the diagnosis very strongly. And then you tend to not have oligoclonal bands, which you see often in MS. Um, this is a typical MRI of a patient with NMO, and um, I don't know if you can see it back from the back, but there's a, a, a white area within the gray spinal cord here that corresponds to a longitudinally extensive lesion. Um, there's an enhancement here. It doesn't have to be as long, but it's clear that there's inflammation going on over here in the cervical spine, and this is pretty typical of NMO. So again, these are clues that help us distinguish between NMO and MS. Um, so I'm going to go on to the epidemiology of NMO, and this is a particularly tough topic because NMO is a rare disease, and it's tough to uh, get a lot of data on rare diseases. Um, but the good news is that about every month or so, another paper comes out describing another population of NMO patients. For example, this week a patient, uh, a group from Korea published 
uh, a database of, I think, 50 kids with NMO in Korea. So we're accumulating this data. This chart is actually outdated. But what this chart shows is that is the rate of NMO out of all demyelinating diseases in a particular region. So in the US, for example, about 1.5% of all demyelinating diseases, which includes MS, transverse myelitis, ADEM, and everything you've heard about so far, among all of those, 1.5% are actually NMO. And that number will probably grow as doctors start to realize, oh, my patient doesn't, act, doesn't actually have MS. They probably have NMO. That number is um, constant uh, across uh, Europe as well. And then there are these really uh, rich areas of NMO where it tends to be uh, very common in the West Indies uh, and in Singapore and, and in Japan. And this may be just a definition issue, but it, there also seems to be a predisposition in these areas to develop NMO rather than MS. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, put a plug in for a project that we're doing, sponsored by the Guthy Jackson Group. Uh, it's, a, it's a collaboration between uh, the Hopkins Group, where I am, Mayo Clinic, and here at UT, along with the Accelerated Cure Project, to gather as much information about NMO patients as possible into a single database where we all have access. We can all ask very specific questions about epidemiology and demographics and risk factors and what vaccines you've had and where you've traveled and what did you smoke when you were you know, a teenager. All, the, all that kind of information into a database where we can try to figure out what you all have in common, try to understand this disease better. You'll hear more about that project coming up. Um, just quickly about the pathogenesis of disease. So what actually causes the disease? Um, all, a lot of us in the field of NMO have focused on the NMO IgG antibody. Again, this is a blood test that your doctor sends off when he or she suspects you have NMO. And if it comes back positive, it's strongly uh, suspicious of, strongly suggestive of NMO. And so naturally, as a scientist, we focused on this antibody. What does it mean? What is it, uh, what is it actually doing? And there are two schools of thought. One is that the antibody causes the disease, that it's involved in uh, inducing inflammation. It binds to its target aquaporin-4, which is found in the brain, and it can, um, it can stimulate inflammation. And so a simple way to think about it is, well, simple antibody binding to the target in the brain induces inflammation. So if you have the antibody, it can get into the brain, it can cause inflammation on its own. And uh, so again, the really simple way to think about this is the NMO IgG, which is the uh, antibody that binds aquaporin-4, in the presence of complement, creates inflammation. And uh, so a group in uh, collaboration between England and California has shown that when you inject the antibody with complement into a normal mouse uh, brain, it can do just that. It can create NMO-like inflammation, which looks just like human NMO. It has neutrophils. It has complement deposition, as I showed you before. So again, this is a very simplified way to think about it. but. Just presence of the antibody with complement can create inflammation. And in our lab, we've shown that this antibody in the setting of, of an animal model for MS called EAE can make things worse. So the antibody itself can make things worse. And there's, again, pathology consistent with that. Um, so there, there are other people who think that the antibody is not pathogenic and they have a very good case. In other words, that the antibody does not create disease because there may be several patients that may be in, in this audience who have NMO but don't have the antibody. And so in that case, what's inducing your inflammation? Well, we don't know. Um, again, these are just models that we work on in animals to try to understand what causes the disease. Okay, so again, how does your doctor work this up? How, how does your doctor make sure that you have NMO and not MS and why is this important? Well. It's really important because if you have NMO and you get treated with drugs that treat MS, you're, you probably either won't do well, you actually do worse, or, or you won't be treated appropriately and you just, uh, what you need is treatment specific for NMO. And so how do we know that? Well, just within the past few years, there's several papers uh, that have come out that have shown that 
drugs for MS, the beta interferons, can actually make NMO worse. So it's really important that you, that your doctor check uh, uh, to make sure that you don't have MS. And how does he do that? Well, again, there's several clues. Um, one big clue um, is the MRI, looking for a long lesion in the spinal cord. Again, that's a really big clue. Other clues are permanent destruction, as you, you, you may know if you have NMO. Once you have a lesion, it's really hard to recover from it. In contrast, when an MS patient has a lesion, they can get a little bit of steroids and often pop right back. That's a really big clinical clue between the difference, uh, the difference between the two. Um, again, NMO patients often test positive for the antibody. There are negative patients or patients who don't, who test negative for the antibody, who truly have NMO, and those patients are harder to identify. Uh, and we are, I'd like to put another plug in for our research effort. Again, this consortium is planning to draw blood from NMO patients every month, try to understand what factors in your blood are responsible for creating disease and what factors in your blood are good biomarkers for remission. So that's another uh, part of this project that we're doing in collaboration with the Mayo and UT. Okay, so just a quick slide about treatment. If you have an acute attack of NMO, the first thing you want to get is steroids. Um, you, you usually get it on, you know, in the first hour that you're in the emergency room, and you'll continue to get it for two, three days at least. And if you don't make a quick turnaround, then we usually initiate plasma exchange. And that is the standard of care for NMO, and it works really well. And th the neat thing about plasma exchange um, is that I've had a patient who was nine months out of her optic neuritis who came into my clinic and said, you know, I, th I think my vision is still getting worse, even over these nine months, just a very slow progression. And we initiated plasma exchange in her, and she recovered a little bit of light perception in that eye. So even nine months after the initiation of that inflammatory event, plasma exchange still helped. And that was despite uh, steroids. So that's the acute treatment. Now, preventatively, we rely on three drugs. You, um, you've heard about these. The classic drug is azathioprine. It's the one that was shown to be uh, effective first in about seven patients. And it's only seven patients, so uh, you know we don't have a lot of efficacy data. But that's since been validated in a few countries where they don't have access to more expensive drugs. And they show it still works. So azathioprine is a reliable choice. The problem in the US is that t about 10% of our population will become toxic on the drug. And we have to do an expensive genetic test first. And uh, that can pose a problem. But it's still the standard of choice in children because it has the most safety data. It's been around the longest. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies developed a drug similar to azathioprine that does not have the toxicity issue. That's called mycophenolate or Celsept. And in a retrospective case review of 24 patients, again, this is not that many patients because that's all that, that we have. Uh, but in, in those 24 patients, uh, there was a 90% reduction in relapse rate. That is a phenomenal effect. That's not quite a cure, but it's a very good effect, and we're very happy with that. And it was uh, effective in 91% of NMO patients. Um, it does require quite intensive blood monitoring. You have to get a, a blood test every month for a while to make sure that the dose is right, to make sure it's not toxic. But it's still uh, one of those life-changing drugs. And kind of similar to that, there, there are two basic options that we have now that um, we commonly use. And the other drug is called rituximab. In a case series of 25 patients, again, 90% reduction in relapse rate. So these are, are two options. And we kind of go back and forth. Um, I'd say about 60% of my patients are on rituxan, about 30% are on Celsept, and about 10% on Imuran. And it's more of a discussion with my patient, well, you know, do you want to take a pill every day? Would you prefer an infusion every few months? And you know, how how frequency can how frequent can we monitor your blood and that kind of discussion? Because they're they're pretty much equally effective. And if they fail one, well, then we just try them on the other. So that was a really quick uh, just uh, introduction to um, neuromyelitis optica. And again, uh, the only reason I put up this slide is because.
as we get this database um, rolled out, I really want to include as much data from NMO patients as possible. Right now, we only have three centers. Again, it's Hopkins, Mayo, and Texas. They're spread apart, but there are a lot of patients in between. And if you can't make it to one of our centers, which is the best way to enroll in our study, then we, we have a, a, a way to come to you. Um, so this is my contact information. If you want us to come to you, we can do that. We can collect that information from you. And so uh, you know, feel free to reach me at probably my mobile phone is the best. So thanks again for the chance to talk with you.